Hey everybody, it's Mr. Robbins back again to begin our conversation of period 7B. So as we talked about with period 7A, 7B is kind of something we made up here at Peace Tree Ridge, uh, which is all well and good because it means the tests are probably a little easier with doing it this way, at least we think so. Um, but uh, that means that we're going to kind of bleed over and the dividing lines not going to be so clear. So I'm going to kind of take a step back, talk about a couple things that I did mention at the end of 7A um, in some of our conversations, and then kind of be moving forward as we start to talk about um, one of the periods that a lot of folks are really interested in, um, have been for many years, and now that uh, it's kind of like 100 years ago now. Uh, it is becoming more and more interesting because folks want to know, are we in our roaring 20s and the 2020s? I don't know. Still early. Uh, but I can tell you the 1920s were roaring. And so we'll get into that a little bit today. Uh, but let's get ourselves started because where we last left off lecture-wise, the war had just ended. And it's not just like the war ended and it's like, okay, yeah, everything's back to normal. It was a little bit more complicated than that. And so we need to pick up with the Red Scare. So as we talked about at the end of period 7A, one of the important outcomes of World War I was uh, the creation of the Soviet Union. Um, of course... With the October Revolution in November of 1917, yes, no, I, 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 that's true, look it up. Um, confusing, I know, the Russians use a different calendar, okay? Um, but with that, uh, short, just you know, a few months after we had entered the war, on their side, the side of the Allies, um, the Bolshevik faction led by that guy up there, Vladimir Lenin, will overthrow the government of Russia, which had actually just been installed earlier that year uh, due to complaints about Russia's entrance into the war and fighting in the war. Uh, they captured and then executed the Tsar and his family uh, and began basically a civil war that would continue for several more years in the Soviet Union uh, that would at times be uh, fought with the help or the against uh, allies and central powers in World War I, including the United States, who intervenes in Russia uh, after the end of World War I. Um, for our purposes here, though, we're much more focused on what is the reaction here in America to this. And simply put, it is a very concerned reaction. Because there is a, a fear that there are American Bolsheviks of some sort or an Amer American Lenin out there who maybe is going to also going to try to undermine and overthrow the U.S. government. Um, and you couple this with a sharp recession after the end of the war, which should not have come as a huge surprise. Wartime causes a lot of spending and spun up a lot of factories in northern and midwestern cities, and when the war ends and those weapons aren't needed anymore, well, a lot of these factories and uh, other businesses start to lay off workers, and some of them go out of business entirely. Uh, we see that prices raise by about 15%, uh, 100,000 businesses would declare bankruptcy, 5 million workers lose their jobs. And so this is all happening in this immediate post-war era. All of this helps to create a strike wave that spreads all across the country and is in every major region of the United States. Uh, at its peak, 3,600 strikes uh, would go by uh, 1919 going into 1920, over 4 million workers going on strike. Okay, Now, many of these strikes are the ones that we've talked about in previous units, like pe uh, Period 6, where they're kind of focused in like one particular industry or even like one particular factory. But there were some novel strikes that occurred 
uh, in this uh, immediate post-war period that did cause heightened concern. One of the most notable ones was in Seattle, where a general strike had occurred. Now, a general strike is new to the United States. This has not really happened here, but it happened in Europe uh, and in Russia, where there was not just a strike of one union or one uh, factory or one business, but workers for many of the factories and businesses in the Seattle area all went on strike in solidarity with each other. And this image shows you this general strike. It, it, it shut down all business and commerce in Seattle for, for many days. Okay, um, This strike wave also has another novel feature uh, in Boston, Massachusetts, where police go on strike. They do a walkout. While there are these other strikes and unrest going on in that town in Boston, and there's no one to keep the peace or uh, manage these things, it was a very dicey time, and people were starting to get concerned. Now, we see that the press very much is critical of unions. This is not necessarily anything new. Uh, we had seen similar kind of pushback in the Gilded Age as well. Um, and so the press will talk about these strikes as crimes against society, conspiracies against the government, and then, yes, they connect these union strikes to plots to establish communism. And while not all the folks that went on strike were communists, there is some truth to that, that the more radical and maybe ones that might want to see kind of a October Revolution in the United States they're probably participating in this strike wave on some level, if not helping to lead it. Now, the press and citizens, business owners, folks that are alarmed by this, not all the citizens are, some are the ones striking, so some of them are perfectly fine with this, but the ones who are more alarmed, uh, they are at least slightly reassured when in Boston... Uh, particularly the governor of Massachusetts steps in, this guy Calvin Coolidge, uh, and he calls in the National Guard to restore order in Boston, going around the police unions and uh, the walkout. Uh, Coolidge ultimately uh, helped stabilize the situation. This made him kind of a national star, and he said, and he was not one to have a lot of words, um, he was, his nickname was Silent Cal, he said, quote, there is no right to strike against the public safety by anybody, anywhere, anytime. And so he was seen to be tough and kind of establishing law and order in his home state. But that is not it. There were other things going on as well, most notably a outbreak of anarchist violence. Now the communists, they're the ones trying to organize the workers, but anarchists, they don't want to organize workers. Uh, they don't want to have a communist state led by workers. They don't want to have any state led by anyone because they reject all hierarchies. And the anarchists, too, are doing their thing. Um, in April of 1919, uh, U.S. Postal Service agents will find and defuse over 30 mail bombs to businessmen and politicians across the country. Two months after that, in June of 1919, a bomb, uh, uh, or a series of bombs, explodes across the country. One that is the most notable is a bomb, a mail bomb, that was placed outside the home of the sitting Attorney General, a. Mitchell Palmer in Washington, D.C. No one dies in these bombings, uh, although there is a lot of physical damage. Here you see the facade, the front of Palmer's house. It was heavily uh, injured, and his family was home. They just were uninjured by the bomb. Um, but it seems like there is a conspiracy, and Palmer himself, as Attorney General, has a direct line on what the decision is to... Well, as to what to do, because he's the le chief law enforcement official in the country. This fear and anxiety about these strikes and bombings 
the the ascendance of radicals, communists, anarchists is what we call the Red Scare. And very technically, this is what we call the first Red Scare, because when I say the Red Scare, you're probably thinking of the later communist fear that comes about as we are in the 1950s, but we're not there yet. Um, this first Red Scare was prompted by these events we've talked about, um, and it is uh, acted upon by Palmer. Okay, Now, the reality is, is that these radicals, communists, there's not that many of them. We're talking like one-tenth of one percent of all adult Americans, so you're talking about like a few hundred, maybe like low thousands, but not very many people in the grand scheme of things. But the way that Palmer institutes his Palmer raids, they sweep up thousands and thousands of people uh, that may be connected to communists and radical thought. Now, it takes a while, uh, but by January of 1920, Palmer institutes these raids, uh, arresting 5,000 suspects across the country, mostly in cities. Now, what Palmer and these agents of the Justice Department do, though, is that they um, oftentimes break into these homes without arrest warrants. For the most part, that's what was happening. So they had no legal authority to break into the homes and clubs, coffee shops, union offices that they break into, but they do it anyway. Um, now, in many ways, this was supposed to be like a scare tactic, like you're trying to frighten these people into not doing what they're doing anymore, um, because Palmer and his agents are not dumb. They know that in a court of law, a lot of these any evidence they would find would probably not stand up in court because they weren't supposed to be uh, raiding these people's um, homes and things. But that's, again, not really the point. They're trying to send a message. And then when some of the people they round up, some of them were actually immigrants, uh, uh, and they maybe could, maybe couldn't kind of document their immigration uh, status, although back then there were a lot of immigrants in the country. Um, and some of these immigrants, because of their radical ties, uh, will be deemed unfit to stay in the country, and they're deported, uh, 500 of them, and they don't get a trial, they don't get a hearing in court, they get no due process, they are just deported. Now, while there might have been some appetite for this kind of uh, hard pushback on the radicals, we see that it also causes a counter-response, and... It is oftentimes these Palmer raids considered the end of the first Red Scare because the, the response from Americans uh, like lawyers, judges, and other defenders of civil liberties like the freedom of speech and freedom of assembly amongst others, they stand up and say this is not right. Now, uh, we see this is the genesis of the forming of a new group, the ACLU, or the American Civil Liberties Union, still around today, um, which would fight on the behalf of some of the arrested folks, trying to get them off of charges. We also have a few uh, members of the U.S. Supreme Court who actually come out and publicly talk about the need to have tolerance and to allow freedom of expression uh, which kind of is a dampener on all of this kind of mania around the Red Scare. And as we move into uh, the beginning of the decade, uh, this fear of radicals kind of begins to subside. It doesn't totally go away, but no longer are you going to see this kind of government overreach. Now, of course, all this is happening in a presidential election year. 1920 is a presidential election year. Wilson, as we talked about, he's already served two terms, but also his health is very poor. He's uh, going to pass away shortly after this election. Um, we're going to have a new president. Okay. Now, the Democratic candidates, one of them you're probably not going to know, James M. Cox, the governor of Ohio. Uh, his vice presidential candidate you probably know uh, the at that point, Assistant Secretary of the Navy, Franklin D. Roosevelt, uh, 
more on him later in 7B. Uh, they are saying we're going to push progressive ideals. We're going to continue this progressive era, as had been demonstrated by President Wilson, and continue it into this new decade. But the Republican candidates, a senator from Ohio, Warren G. Harding, you see below, um, and his vice presidential candidate, yes, Calvin Coolidge, at that point the governor of Massachusetts, they promised something different, a return to what Harding called normalcy, right? Like things going back to normal, getting away from these wartime restrictions of World War I, getting away from the turmoil of the progressive era with all these changes uh, which the Republicans would say some were needed, but we had made the changes that were needed, okay? And this message resonates with the country. And uh, Harding wins a landslide victory, and they win every state except for the solid South. Uh, and even then, some, uh, some so Southern states do go to the Republican candidate. And so this is the uh, feeling Americans get. It's a new era of peace and prosperity in the 1920s. Here's the electoral map. As you see, uh, Republicans sweep the Northeast, uh, the Midwest, the West. Um, of course, Democrats still hold firm in the Southern states, uh, mostly because of the Democrats' continued embrace of, of Southern Democrats' um, Jim Crow system, or at least looking the other way at their Jim Crow system. But even then, Tennessee goes for the Republican. Uh, Missouri goes for the Republican. So there's some southern states that do uh, kind of uh, go along with this wave in a huge landslide victory. 60% of the popular vote, that's, that's crazy. Uh, and then 76% of the electoral college vote. It, it's a sizable victory. Okay, so let's move on into a new theme for the 20s, the automobile. Now... We didn't talk about when the automobile was actually invented. Uh, it came to be in the late 1890s, uh, an automatic carriage, you know, replacing the horses and all that. But there's not a lot of talk about cars in the late Gilded Age and the very turn of the century because, simply put, they're not um, easy to get your hands on. They're a toy for the very rich. You know, it's, you know, something fun, you know, something to say, hey, I got this cool new toy. They call it a car, okay, because it's, it's an automatic carriage, right? But that's all going to change as we move into the 1920s with the vision of this guy, Henry Ford. He was a engineer, self-taught engineer, who had a crazy idea that he was going to, quote, democratize the automobile. And when I'm through, everyone will be able to afford one. Now, if you told someone that in, like, 1915, they'd be like, mm, well, okay, buddy, we'll see about that. But you know what his name is. Yeah, he was kind of right. How did he do this? Well... He did it through revolutionizing the process to create a vehicle. Now, very importantly, Henry Ford did not invent the assembly line. Okay, He did not invent it. But he did perfect it on the use of these automobiles um, and the automobile factories that he created um, were very different. Uh, the automobiles of the, those early eras, they were in one place, and all the workers worked around the cars, putting them together, kind of more like a garage when you go get your car fixed or tuned up where they, they're working on it all in one place. But that's not how Ford operated his automobile plants. Instead, they were on, the cars were on conveyor belts, and you started at one end of the assembly line with the chassis, and bit by bit as the assembly line moved forward, workers who stayed stationary... They put the parts on, okay? And so as you go down the line, one guy's putting on one thing, another guy's putting on another thing, until the end of the line, you have a fully functioning vehicle. Now, what was the benefit of this process? Well, it made it remarkably cheaper and quicker to produce a vehicle, okay? Um, before this assembly line, it would take somewhere around 12.5 hours to make a car, okay? And that's like working completely 100% during that time. 
With Ford's processes, you could build uh, one of his Model T's in an hour and a half. Okay, And the thing is about manufacturing and mass production is that there is an economic context called economies of scale, where once you get to a certain point and you're making your products so quickly and efficiently and at such large numbers, you're able to sell your products at a lower price point. And that was what Ford was trying to do. He was trying to make it cheaper to produce a car, more efficient, so that he could, he could still offer it at a lower price point while making it profit. And that is exactly what he did. Um, the first Model T's in 1908 were 850 bucks, which back then, I mean, that's, you know, a few thousand dollars, okay, uh, accounting for inflation. But by 1924, that same car, new model, was $290, okay, then, like, not even two whole decades. That is a remarkable difference. Now, it's not even just that, um, you know, when Ford had his workers, and you see kind of some of them working on the assembly line here, the guys over here on the left uh, working on putting on the tires, um, he paid his workers well. He, he would argue this allowed his workers to turn around and buy one of his cars, which is exactly what they did. Um, so his workers mostly drove Fords because they could afford one. Um, and more and more people are going to have access to them as we move into the decade of the 1920s. Okay? Now, Ford revolutionizes the assembly line for cars, but the, the, the benefits of this are not only seen in the automobile industry. We see that new appliances like refrigerators, uh, electric appliances like refrigerators, washing machines, electric irons, they're going to be made through similar processes as assembly lines as well. Okay. Now, with that said, though, it does make these products cheaper, more accessible, but there, there is a flip side. Okay. There are consequences to this that maybe aren't so good as well. Um, the jobs are pretty monotonous, right? Like, I mean, uh, working on an automobile and making it kind of in that craft artisan style, like you're maybe doing several dis different tasks every day and, you know, you're troubleshooting things and trying to figure out how things work. But not in the assembly line. That wasn't your job. When the assembly line, you had one job, and if you were on the pin assembly line, you'd be like, you know, screwing the top on, you know, and then you get another one, you screw the top on, and you just kind of keep doing that all day. It's very monotonous, and it's boring, and, and you kind of like zone out, and you're like, am I really working, right? You're kind of like a, a robot in a way. Um, it eliminates craftsmanship, so you don't have like kind of unique items or like high craft, like they're, they're mass-produced items. Uh, they're not kind of have that craftsman artistry that maybe a hand produced item would. Okay. But the impacts go far beyond that on our lives. Um, in the late 1920s, a group of sociologists would ask a resident of Muncie, Indiana, out in the Midwest, to describe the changes around him. Uh, and his response is, is pretty funny. Um, quote, why on earth do I need to study what's changing? You, why on earth do you need to study what's changing in this country? I can tell you what's happening in just four letters. A-U-T-O. And that guy pulling their leg a little bit, but he, he's right. You know, the change is obvious. The automobile has, has will completely change the United States forever. Um, we see that more and more folks are buying cars. As more and more folks are buying cars, other industries that provided the needed supplies for those cars, so the steel industry, rubber industry, glass, um, oil industry producing uh, gasoline for the internal combustion engines to run, to run on, they all also grow along with the growth of the automobile. They, they follow along with it. Starting in 1916 with the Federal Aid Road Act, we start to see the first system of paved roads, paved highways crisscrossing the country. These are not the interstates. Those come later in the 1950s. But these early highways make it where you can drive from one end of the United States to another end reasonably. 
But it's more than that. It changes what, to a certain extent, daily life is like, okay? Um, it's no longer these isolated small towns, which, you know, people, even if they wanted to kind of to see the world a little bit more, most folks didn't have that opportunity. Well, with the car, that's becoming more and more likely, and towns and these are more interconnected and cities are more interconnected and you start to see more and more of the development of the suburbs which began in a small way during the Gilded Age but then accelerates as we move into the 1920s. Gas stations are kind of an ubiquitous part of our lives like those didn't exist before automobiles like why would they okay road signs didn't exist why would they three color traffic lights Diners on the roadside, um, traffic jams, some stuff that we still appreciate today. Those are woven into what it is to be American and to live in America by this invention. Now, we see that, of course, the downsides of this technological innovation of the assembly line is that, yes, humans are kind of acting as robots in a way, as they get less autonomy and the machines help do more of the work. There was a reason for this. This goes back to this idea of Taylorism uh, that had been promoted uh, by businesses since the turn of the century, kind of scientific management, uh, trying to eliminate waste, reduce costs. Uh, and Taylor would do this with time and motion studies where he figured out where is the optimal place to put different parts of the factory so workers don't have to waste time moving long distances, uh, eliminate workers who are unnecessary, who only act as middlemen in the factory. That all uh, helped to make businesses like Ford's much more efficient. But we're going to see in a later era, by the time we get to period uh, 9, uh, automobile companies are moving away from this uh, uh, assembly line form of production and going to not using so-called human robots, but like literal robots to help uh, create uh, cars on assembly lines. Now, of course, these robots are even more efficient than humans. They're very cost-effective. They're far more safe. They can't get hurt on the job. They make far fewer mistakes. But there is a backlash to this as well. And this is something that we're continuing to live through that uh, critics would argue an automation bomb, so to speak, can go off. And once most of these factories are automated or mostly automated, well, what, what's going to happen to all the Americans that had those jobs to begin with? Um, well, what we know has happened is that there are fewer jobs in the manufacturing industry than there have been in previous generations. That's the direct effect of these robots. Now, there are more jobs with, for highly trained technicians and engineers that work on the robots, okay? But in terms of kind of regular Joes doing like, you know, putting the pin tops on, those jobs, if they do exist today in 2021, they are rapidly coming to an end even more with every day that passes. All right. So now that we've kind of set the stage, let's finish up today's lecture by talking about, yes, the Roaring Twenties. There are many different themes that come together to make this decade roaring, you know, crazy, boisterous. One of the first, though, is something that we hear, the radio. Um, when Harding won in November of 1920, um, that news was broadcasted in Pittsburgh by radio station KDKA um, that night. Um, and that radio broadcast would be the first of many through the decade of the 1920s and the beginning of the radio industry. Um, by the end of the decade, uh, somewhere around one-third of all American households had a radio. Uh, whereas at the beginning of the decade, that was almost not quite near zero. Now, folks take to the radio so quickly. Um, people buy them. Uh, they're pretty easy and cheap to get, especially if you get credit. Uh, you can listen to the news, breaking news even, uh, weather reports, 
You can listen to baseball games or college football games or boxing matches, comedy shows, religious programming. Yeah. This increasingly is creating what we would call a popular culture in the United States. A shared popular culture. Something that we take for granted in the modern day because, you know, a lot of us are, have access to stuff like Netflix and we can watch a lot of the same shows, okay? But that never really existed before. I mean, there were instances, things like national movements like the Great Awakenings where, like, you know, preachers travel across the country. But kind of a persistent cultural um, mixing across the whole of the huge United States was only really made possible first with the radio. Um, we see that it also affects businesses because businesses start to realize like radio is a good area to advertise. At first they're like, mm, it's not going to be as good as newspapers, but it eventually becomes a big, big ad market. And by 1929, uh, there's about $1 billion spent to air commercials on radio. Uh, and these uh, commercials are for new consumer products, vacuum cleaners, other consumer products, toothpaste, things like that. Now this shows us kind of the extent of radio broadcasts across the country. Of course, not every single area of the country is, is, is covered by radio uh, broadcasters, but most of them are. Uh, but you see the preponderance is in the Midwest and in the Northeast and uh, a little bit in the West. But, you know, in the South, there are plenty of radio broadcasts down here as well. Um, advertising, again, does happen over the radio, but you have the ubiquitous advertising in magazines and newspapers. Chevy, um, part of General Motors, trying to sell you a car. Coca-Cola, trying to sell you soda. Not so bad for you back then, you know. It was, but they didn't know. Next aspect of popular culture, movies. Now, movies had existed before the 1920s. We just really haven't talked about them a lot yet. Uh, we talked about propaganda films during World War I, but uh, the, the industry really started in 1903 with a uh, brief refilm called The Great Train Robbery. It was literally 12 minutes long, and they called this a movie, um, and people saw them in the, the new movie theaters, Nickelodeons, uh, some of them were called because you go pay a nickel. Um, and the most iconic image from this scene is when the, 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 one of the gangs, the, the cowboys, outlaws, he has a gun and he shoots at the camera and people like literally like, <gasps> oh, I'm going to die. Um, yeah, it's pretty hilarious. Um, that was the beginning of the, uh, movie industry as we, uh, would know it today. Now, by the 1920s, the movies were very well established. Uh, 80 million tickets a week. I mean, this is a peak of, of movie going. Like, I mean, people don't have TVs yet, so you can't, you want to watch something, you gotta go to the movies. Um, now, of course, at first, the films of the 20s, uh, would be silent films, because they have figured out how to record, but not how to record, uh, and play audio at the same time. But there are very famous silent film stars. You have Greta Garbo up there. Uh, over here in the middle, Charlie Chaplin, uh, and then Rudolph Valentino, a, a, you know, a romantic uh, movie star. Uh, they make six-figure salaries, which is, you know, they're not millionaires, but they're doing well by their era. But by 1927, the silent film era would come to an end with the release of a new movie, the first talkie, The Jazz Singer. Uh, and very quickly, the movie industry moves into the talky realm with these uh, movies that do have sound and dialogue attached to them. Um, and so, soon, new stars take the place of the older silent film era, um, and movies only become more and more popular. Now, The Jazz Singer, um, it is historic for that reason. Um, it, it is controversial, uh, because the most important bit of this movie, or the most memorable bit of this movie, is that the main character played by singer Al Jolson, he wants to be a jazz singer, as the name implies, um, and that meant that he had to be um, in blackface. Yeah, 
not too great. Uh, the NAACP boycotted this movie in, in certain cities across the country, uh, but it was still immensely popular. Uh, Jolson was kind of taken back by some of the criticism because uh, he thought of himself as, as an ally of black folks uh, in, uh, in a time where blackface was not seen as negatively uh, universally as it is today. Um, but sending the controversy aside, it is still historically significant because it does start this talking movie business, which will just continue to get bigger and bigger throughout the 20s going into the 30s and beyond. Flappers! Young women. Okay, uh, We see that in the 20s, uh, there's a lot of challenge to traditional values among young adults, especially young women. Um, and there's no mistake as to why this is. Uh, of course, we saw during the war women stepping up to take roles and jobs that men used to fill. Um, women now have the right to vote nationally. And younger women are going to take advantage of these changes and maybe decide to do something different. Now, most women would of this era, they just do what women before did. They, you know, would get married, start a family, many of them being housemakers, you know, homemakers. Um, that's nothing new. But a growing, a small but growing group of women eschew that. They, they say, we don't want that, Okay. Uh, we're going to choose a different lifestyle, especially college-educated women. Uh, they decide they want freedom. Okay, so they start to pursue careers and careers uh, areas that were shut to them not too long ago in medicine, law, and science. And then young women uh, that we call the flappers start to really flaunt what it is for, for what a woman should look like in the 1920s. Now, we don't really know where the nickname Flappers comes from. There's a lot of different speculation from their bobbed haircuts, short haircuts that would move around, or their, their very short uh, skirts that you could see their knees. <gasps> you know, right? Those would flap around. Don't worry about why they're called Flappers. Just know that's what they're called. Um, but they're, they have a style. There's a type, okay? They wear shorter skirts, again, that show knees. Ankles, just scandalous stuff like ankles. Uh, they wear a lot of makeup, which is heavily advertised to young women. They have short hair styles, bobbed haircuts, which uh, are very much in style in this era. Um, they will do unwomanly things like smoke cigarettes. Uh, in prior uh, eras, it was seen as unwomanly for women to smoke, and they'll, these slappers start doing it. They will participate in the craze of bootlegging during Prohibition and drink illegal liquor. And the dance, scandalous dances like the Charleston, which if you've ever actually seen anyone dance to Charleston, it's kind of funny to call it scandalous. Go look that up. It's, it's what they thought. I mean, look at these women, okay? Just dancing in front of a room of men. Lifting their legs up in the air. I see these ladies' ankles and knees. I'm not supposed to see that. I see a shoulder uncovered. That's just not right. right? You can't show that much skin. Hopefully you know I'm joking, guys. Because if you think I'm serious, you're like, wait, what is Mr. Robbins' life like? Right? Now... One last thing I want to talk about with the Roaring Twenties will be art and literature. Um, we see that uh, there are some artists and writers that don't really like all these changes of the Roaring Twenties in that they look at them very cynically. Okay, um, These writers, we'll call them members, uh, members of the Lost Generation, guys like F. Scott Fitzgerald up top, Sinclair Lewis below, Ernest Hemingway, amongst others. Um, they were disillusioned with American culture. Many of them had participated at a higher level during World War I. Hemingway is one of them. And after all of the death and destruction and all the young men they saw die, and to come to back to America and see everyone's like, yeah, everything's great, woo! They're like, how can this be? How can this be? Many of them would move to Paris where, you know, while there was also kind of a freewheeling lifestyle, there was at least more notice of the impact of the war on people's lives. 
Now, again, Fitzgerald, Lewis, some of the best-known novelists of the era. Uh, you probably know Fitzgerald the best uh, due to his very, very popular book, The Great Gatsby, which for many Americans in the modern day is like synonymous with the Roaring Twenties and is you know, a, a good snapshot in, into the life of kind of affluent folks in the 1920s. Um, we see that Lewis has a different style. It's very satiric, very ironic uh, with his uh, books, Main Street, uh, another Babbitt, uh, where Babbitt's, he's like this businessman caught up in the, the, the roaring commerce of the 20s and uh, eventually realizes, like, what am I doing? What's going on around me? And kind of observes the, the ludicrousness of the 20s around him. Uh, now, these critics are a small group, but they're an influential one. And especially in the years to come, their views, very cynical views of the 1920s, are far more heard. And that has a lot to do with the turmoil that comes later after the 20s. Now, we're going to leave it there. We do still have a little bit more art to talk about, but the Harlem Renaissance also connects in some other themes with African Americans. So we'll save that for next time, and we'll wrap up the 1920s with that. And then some of the things that maybe weren't so great in the 1920s and don't make it a roaring time for at least some people. But we'll leave it there, and we'll see you next time. Bye!